Good morning. A warm welcome to all of you who have uh, logged in today for this so, uh, CDE, the online webinar on soft tissue handling in periodontal plastic and implant surgery being organized by the Department of Periodontics, Abishati Memorial Institute of Dental Sciences in association with the ISP study group, Mangalore. Now, all of us periodontists are involved with periodontal plastic surgeries. And the fact is, over time, there has been a lot of improvement, or I, I may call it refinement in the techniques, the instruments, the suturing techniques, etc. Today is the era of minimally invasive surgical techniques. But the fact remains that there is even today some element of unpredictability in our peron plastic surgery procedures because many a time we may not be able to achieve the result that we desired. I wouldn't call it a failure, but rather the lack of achieving what we intended to. And, many, and the fact is that we are many a time we are not even able to understand why the surgical procedure has not given us the expected result. Now, to talk to us more about these aspects, we have with us Dr. Hari Kumar, professor from the Government Dental College, Calicut, <coughs> excuse me, who will throw more light on the various aspects of soft tissue handling in plastic surgeries. He'll be formally introduced to you later, but from my side, I'd say that I know Dr. Hari Kumar for the past quarter century, a very dedicated and committed academician with a lot of achievements to his credit and special focus on periodontal plastic surgical procedures. And today he's going to enlighten us on the various aspects of soft tissue handling in the periodontal plastic as well as implant surgical pro protocols. He'll be focusing on why the basic aspects of soft tissue augmentation, the risk techniques available and the recent evidence, the evaluation of the clinical outcomes and the key factors affecting outcomes. He'll be talking on the tips and tricks in soft tissue handling based on his clinical experience. Also the key factors in selecting the techniques for soft augmentation and the paradigm shifts in the evolution of flap designs and modifications. Now, as we get, get along with this program, I would like to invite Dr. Amita Ramesh, Professor and Head, Department of Periodontics, to formally welcome the gathering. Over to you, Professor Dr. Amita Ramesh. A very good morning, one and all. Aesthetic demands are consistently on the rise and the periodontal plastic surgery has evolved dramatically over the past 50 years. The search for better alternatives has allowed us to develop the techniques of grafting like sub-epithelial connective tissue grafts and its modification. This new flap approach has proved to be very effective from the aesthetic point of view, causing perfect integration of the tissues and absence of scarring and the optimal vascular flow for the overall satisfactory result for the patients. Today, we have with us a very eminent and renowned speaker, Dr. Hari Kumar, who's going to enlighten us on this soft tissue handling in the periodontal plastic and implant surgery. First of all, I would like to tell thanks to the COVID who has introduced us to this virtual platform for, for which we could we can uh, contact with, uh, I think around 500 delegates have logged in today, which has uh, made this, uh, because of this virtual platform, which has made this possible. On this context, I would like to welcome our most now Dean and Principal, Dr. U.S. Krishnayak, our power bank, our everlasting support, I welcome you, sir. I also welcome our vice dean, Dr. Mitra and Hegde, my advisor and an excellent academician. I welcome you, madam. I also welcome our speaker, Dr. Hari Kumar, who is going to talk today on the soft tissue handling. I acknowledge the time taken by you, sir, a valuable time taken by you for being here and has logged in and is going to give a very informative and a very good lecture. And I'm sure she's going to go to the depth and I'm sure all the PGs are going to benefit from this 
program. I welcome you, sir, wholeheartedly. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. For your informative lecture. I Thank heard much about you. <laughs> I was eagerly waiting to hear the lecture, sir. Thank you. I also welcome all the HODs, faculty of all the institutions all over the country, and also the PGs from all the institutions all over the country, and HODs of our own ABSM ideas, our institution, and the PGs of our institution. And a warm welcome to my department of periodontics, faculty, and uh, a welcome to all the delegates who are present here. I also welcome our STC. I acknowledge the work done by the SDDs, SDC for making this program a success. I also welcome the director, Dr. Sadhana Deshmukh, SDC, and team, and all of the NITA officials who have joined this webinar. A very good morning. And awaiting, I uh, request all of you all to participate in this program wholeheartedly, awaiting the lecture and well, welcome all of you all. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, now, Principal and Dean, Professor Dr. U.S. Krishnanayak has been a constant source of support and encouragement for all the activities that we have been carrying out in the Department of Periodontics over the years. Sir, may I now formally invite you to give the presidential address? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bijou. Hey, good morning to Sir, you need to unmute yourself, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Biju. Very warm welcome to all the over 500 delegates who have logged in for this webinar on soft tissue handling in periodontal plastic and implant surgery. Speaker, guest speaker of today, Professor Dr. Hari Kumar Kanakat. Uh, head Department of Periodontics at GDC Calicut. Professor Dr. Amita Ramesh, the HOD Department of Periodontics. I'm sorry, Professor Dr. Mitra Negde, the Vice Dean of our institution. Professor Dr. Amita, Professor Dr. Biju Thomas, the Department and President of the IP, IISP DK branch and Professor Dr. Raul Hegde, the chairperson of this uh, program, Dental Education Unit. I would be failing in my duty if I do not acknowledge the support of each one of the staff in the Department of Periodontics who have conducted this meeting. And I thank the study group of uh, ISP study group of DK Mangalore for associating with our uh, Department of Periodontics and conducting this webinar. All my other colleagues, friends, staff from other institutions, postgraduate students, and uh, my colleagues. It is indeed a privilege to be associated with this uh, program on, uh, though it is soft issue, like Professor Ramita Amita said, Though it is being held on a virtual platform, I think there are certain things that we have to be thankful to COVID for. One of thing, one of the thing is this: before that, we never considered uh, going virtual, but then we realized that as much as there is some shortcoming, we don't meet each other, we don't fellowship at conferences and all that. But definitely, we uh, should I say reinvented this uh, virtual meets, and people from all across the globe could participate in a conference. We could get speakers from anywhere in the globe to speak on any topic. So that is what the main advantage of uh, COVID is, as highlighted by failing in my duty if I do not thank Professor Dr. Hari Kumar Kanakat for sparing his valuable time. Uh, Dr. Hari, thank you very much. 
Thank you, sir. Not met in a long time, but yeah, I and you, I know each other for more than two to three decades. Definitely, sir. I have heard about you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's a long time since I've come to Chennai. If I'm in uh, Calicut for exams, also those days when Dr. Hari and Jairam were there, I used to come very often. Uh, and uh, a big congratulations to the Department of Periodontics for selecting such a lovely topic, a very relevant topic, and the most required and apt topic, contemporary topic, because minimal invasive surgery is the order of the day in anything, any branch, and especially here, as we're talking about periodontics. And the contents of the lecture, all of you have seen, though I'm not a periodontist, uh, Definitely, the topics that are selected for discussion today seem to be the very contemporary ones. More of a time, but uh, I should definitely congratulate Dr. Biju also. I know that Dr. Biju has been very instrumental in organizing this webinar. And as the past president of the Indian Society of Periodontology and also the uh, president of the study group, ISP study group of Mangalore, Biju, uh, you have been quietly working behind the scene, and but I am aware that you are the one who is primarily responsible for organizing this program. And uh, credit goes to Amita, uh, Amita Ramesh largely for uh, giving a free hand to all her colleagues to make sure that they work as a team. Dr. Rahul is there, Dr. Biju, Dr. Amita, and all the other junior staff have worked together a uh, nice program. Thank you, one and all. Congratulations, and have a great next two hours, very interactive two hours with Professor Dr. Hari Kumar Kanakat. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you, sir, for those encouraging words. I'm sure with under your leadership, our department will be doing more and more programs in the days to come. Now, Vice Principal Dr. Mitra Hegde has been a, a constant source of encouragement, has been attending all our programs as has, and has supported us all the years. Madam, may I request you to address the gathering? Thank you, Biju. Uh, respected Principal and Dean, Professor Dr. U.S. Krishnanayak, resource person for the day, Dr. Hari Kumar, Professor GDC Calicut, Head of the Department, Professor Dr. Amita Ramesh, Dr. Biju Thomas, President, ISP DK Branch, Dr. Rahul Bandari, postgraduate students, faculty, wish you all a very good morning. Today's topic that is soft tissue handling in periodontal plastic surgery and implant surgery uh, brings me memories of my days when Dr. Darini used to always quote two things. These are the only things that I remember. We normally say when they tell stories or quote something, we remember it. One thing I remember is handling gingival soft tissue is like handling an infant was the quote that was told for us in the class. I remember it, while handling an infant, you need to have only ounces of pressure. That is what they told us. Then I remember uh, those words, even when I carried my own children, that the ounces of pressure means this, a newborn child. So that, that word still remember is uh, well remembered. And there was one more thing about the soft tissue, gingival soft tissue, which was told to us is, do not touch the gingival attachment apparatus. It is like, touch me not. It goes more apically. So these are the two things which is, which is still there in my a memory about this gingival handling the gingival tissues and I'm sure today with the eminent personalities that you have selected with us with this speciality Dr. Hari Kumar will enlighten all of us about the newer techniques in handling the gingival tissues these are the old knowledge which is a basic knowledge 30 to 35 years ago but definitely now we have newer techniques and newer methods we are all eager to listen to it and thank you for organizing such an excellent program. I think it's the team uh, periodont periodontics with Biju, Amita, Rahul, and the entire team members. I congratulate you for, uh, uh, um, as Sir said, to organizing this event and making it us a part of it. 
all the best and thank you thank you very much uh, madam for those encouraging words it's nice to know that you still remember the period that you have learned 35 years back now we are all eagerly waiting to hear the formal introduction of dr hari kumar hari kumar is a very well learned and known no academician. academician he doesn't need any introduction but, but protocol debuff that, that we have to introduce you now may i request professor dr rahul bhattari to introduce dr hari kumar a very good morning to everybody uh, i am delighted and it's my honor to introduce the chief guest for today's uh, uh, very informative lecture on soft tissue handling uh, it's my pleasure to introduce professor dr hari kumar kanakat who's a keen academician a celebrated periodontist and an implantologist in kerala uh, very rarely do we find a man like dr hari with such great earning for learning and for passion of knowledge despite his unrivaled success he's never want to rest on his laurels he i i come to hear from my peers and my colleagues that he was quite a prodigy in his college days being awarded the, the best outgoing students from his alma mater which is gdc calicut and is also a proud recipient of numerous gold medals for his academic prowess he held the office of the president of the society of periodontists and implantologists of kerala which is known as spic in the year 2019 and 20 as a member of the board of evaluators student project schemes under the kerala state council for science technology and environment and he is currently serving as a member of the ug board of studies kerala university of health sciences he is also a phd guide and is keen in building research uh, at the university level a man of ceaseless pursuit of knowledge and has completed his clinical training in um, in dental implants from bredden germany microsurgery from karl zeiss germany and dental lasers from ild the man of the hour has more than 30 publications in national and international peer reviewed journals and to his credit was an invited speaker for many regional state and national level continuing dental education programs in periodontology by the indian dental association and other organizations uh, we warmly welcome you dr hari and we are keen uh, to listen to your lecture on this very important topic which is the need of the hour in periodontology and implantology thank you thank you dr rahul oh before dr hari formally starts his lecture just two announcement to make all of you can put your questions in the chat box which will be taken up at the end of the lecture because we can avoid any cross talk kindly put your questions in the chat box and secondly at the end of the lecture there will be a feedback form available kindly fill it up and your certificate will be automatically generated hari now the floor is yours we are all eagerly waiting for your lecture okay sir shall i share the screen go ahead it's okay sir Sir, is it okay? Unmute. It's clear. It's clear, Hari. We can see it. It's so very let me, clear. Let uh, me start. Let me start. Uh, yes, please. Good morning, everyone. Very good morning, everyone. Hari, we have muted everybody, so there will be no response. Okay? I know. I know. I know. Uh, yeah. I know. I know. so the topic for the day is soft tissue handling in periodontal plastic and implant surgery i am very happy to talk today in front of this august gathering because of two reasons one is i got an opportunity to be there in the esteem platform of ab shetty memorial institute of dental sciences along with dakshina kannada isp study group and i am happy more that i got an opportunity to talk about soft tissues which always i like to talk about at the outset i thank nitya university ab shetty memorial institute of dental sciences department of periodontics dental education unit and indian society of periodontology dakshina kannada study group for inviting me for this lecture principal and dean krishnaik sir vice principal mitra ma'am 
హెచ్ ఓడి ఆఫ్ పెరియో అమిత రమేష్ డాక్టర్ రాహుల్ ఐ ఎమ్ థ్యాంక్ఫుల్ టు ఈచ్ అండ్ ఎవ్రీ వన్ ఫర్ గివింగ్ మీ దిస్ ఆపర్చునిటీ స్పెషల్ థ్యాంక్స్ టు డాక్టర్ బిజు థామస్ బిజు సార్ హూ ఈస్ ద ఎవర్ గ్రీన్ పర్సనాలిటీ ఆఫ్ పెరిడాండాలజీ ఇన్ ద కంట్రీ థ్యాంక్ యూ వెరీ మచ్ సార్ ఐ ఆల్సో థ్యాంక్ ఆల్ ద పీపుల్ హూ వర్క్ బిహైండ్ దిస్ టు మేక్ దిస్ ప్లాట్ఫామ్ సో అమెనబుల్ టు మీ ఫర్ దిస్ లెక్చర్ i dedicate this presentation to my teachers who taught me periodontology during right from my postgraduate days because uh, i know my postgraduate teacher dr nandumar sir is here i should remember his name before i start any presentation my pg teacher prashanti madam is also here so i am remembering both of them before i start this presentation these are the institutions that i am associated with i did my undergraduate in gdc Kori code. Then I did my postgraduate from GDC through Andrum and I got into the service as a faculty in GDC Kottayam and now I am working as a professor in GDC Calicut. So I remember my institutions before I start this program. Now this presentation actually I have adapted from a few journals which I have gone through. and few standard textbooks that you are all are familiar with which i found very impressive to talk about handling of soft tissues in plastic surgery and apart from this i have incorporated what we were taught during my undergraduate days and what i learned from my experience so i have tried to integrate that also in this presentation so i i, I feel it will be beneficial to you listening to this presentation and at least if you can grasp at least one or two points relevant points at the end of the session i am happy <clears throat> now this presentation uh, i have categorized into i will talk about the why soft tissues we talk about soft tissues because soft tissues are so important because it is often neglected in general dental practice we mo focus more on the white the tooth structure and most of the times the soft tissues are not taken care of most of the times soft tissue is very important because when we start a periodontal surgery or a intraoral surgery we start incising the soft tissues first when we complete the surgery actually we are doing something on the soft tissues again so it's always a gateway of entry into the underlying structures so the way by which you handle the soft tissues is very important i will talk about basic aspects of soft tissue augmentation uh, i will show you some clinical cases both successful and failed cases and we will analyze why the failure has occurred i'll briefly very briefly mention about the techniques available for plastic surgery how you select a case for plastic surgery how you evaluate the case and what is the present evidence then i will go move on to my crux of my presentation that is tips and tricks in soft tissue handling many of these tips you might be knowing you might be practicing but something will be new and i feel this will be uh, a just like a uh, new sort of uh, uh, thought element that will come into your mind when you listen to this area then finally we will end up with uh, the paradigm shifts that has happened in flap designs in periodontal plastic surgery and what is the present status also so this is going to be the framework of my presentation now mucogingival defects it will be the it is the in each and every mouth and there are different types of mucogingival defects and we treat mucogingival defects by mucogingival surgery which was later renamed as periodontal plastic surgery and then came the term mucogingival therapy and if you look into the recent articles it is better known as periodontal phenotype modification therapy ppmt and this word i am going to use in this presentation again and again in the coming slides so the purview of this presentation is to address gingival loss which is the new term for gingival recession and addressing the abnormalities in gingival biotype so to address gingival loss or gingival recession and address the dif difficulties or abnormalities in biotype we will do periodontal phenotype modification therapy now when you look briefly into the pathophysiology of recession there are two pathological mechanisms 
with which recession can occur one is traumatic or centripetal from outside to inside that is what is happening in non periodontitis cases because we often see gingival recession in non periodontitis cases so this is the mechanism and the second one is as you all know it is a sequelae of inflammatory periodontitis that is bacterial it is better known as centrifugal from inside to outside so these are the two mechanisms by which gingival loss can occur now when you look briefly into the classification of gingival recession there are a lot of classification systems the relevant most relevant one are by sullivan and atkins in 1968 pd miller in 1985 still we follow pd miller classification because it has got some sort of prognostic significance then the people highlighted the deficiencies or drawbacks of pd miller classification and uh, there were a lot of modifications in 2010 Pini Prato has modified based on root surface anomalies. Cairo regrouped Miller classes based on interproximal clinical attachment loss in 2011, and there is a classification by Zwiefs et al. in 2014, which is purely phenotype based. And recently, as per 2017 classification working group, Cotellini and Bisada has proposed a new categorization for gingival recession based on detectable cemento enamel junction, step defects. non cervical caries lesions gingival thickness keratinized tissue width etc etc so we look into the literature there are lot of classification systems available as a postgraduate student and as a uh, practitioner we need to know at least uh, the drawbacks and the uh, relevance of each of these classification because all these are relevant clinically because it has evolved over a period of time now broadly gingival augmentation as you know can be done apical to recession and coronal to recession when you do it apical to recession it is more predictable because you are placing the graft or the flap on a recipient bed which is highly vascular but root coverage or augmentation coronal to recession is more challenging because the major part of the graft or flap is resting on a vascular tooth surface that is why there are uh, uh, as amita madam has pointed out there are a lot of uh, variations in the outcome for root coverage procedures and the basic indications for gingival augmentation are one is aesthetics whenever there is an aesthetic problem you can augment the gingiva whenever there is a progression of gingival recession you should augment the gingiva and whenever the patient complains of difficulty in oral hygiene maintenance you can augment the gingiva so these three reasons justifies your surgical procedure now usually for gingival augmentation we use either a graft or a flap a graft is a soft tissue structure that is taken from one side and is replaced to another side or from one body to another body which we usually don't do uh which does not maintain the blood supply from the parent side from which from where it is taken so that is a graft and we use a graft in periodontal phenotype modification therapy and implant surgery this is going to be a free graft as you all know it doesn't have a blood supply a direct blood supply from its parent site another uh, another option we have is we have we can reflect a flap and we can displace the flap the advantage is the flap carries the blood supply of its parent site it is usually done in periodontal plastic surgery implant surgery and we use flaps for as you all know for different packet therapy procedures also so basically we use a flap we use a graft now uh, phenotype modification therapy i will show you one result this is a case where there is a washboard gingiva the root prominence is very visible we have a very visible root prominence and this is the outcome you can see the phenotype has been changed markedly so this is the outcome so i want to show this slide because when you do any gingival augmentation procedure you should not you you never expect you should not expect a 100% result in all cases because there are a lot of factors that are coming into play so we may get if you are attempting a root coverage we may get a 100% root coverage or a partial root coverage if you are augmenting the gingiva if you are changing the phenotype augmenting the gingiva apical to recession we may not get an, an a, a result that an outcome that we expect always why because we will we will we'll see what is happening i will show you few slides so this is a case i will show you few cases with long term follow up which i have done personally and the results are very i will show some failed cases also here a laterally repositioned coronally displaced flap has been done and we have achieved 
100 percent road coverage over a period of five years and here also we have done a laterally repositioned coronally advanced flap we got a partial road coverage almost complete but not complete not 100 percent over a period of two years and this is another case we have miserably failed and this is the photo post-operative photograph of the patient after five years so this is a failed case there are problems in case selection and there may be problems in technique so these may be the reasons and this is a free gingival graph that is done uh, to augment the gingiva apical to recession and we have got a decent uh, result after five years this is another case where the free gingival graft is used to it is placed little more coronally so as to obtain some sort of root coverage and we were very happy with the result after five years and this is the same uh, another situation where we have augmented the gingiva because of the lack of keratinized tissue uh, around the uh, uh, implant uh, before the during the second stage surgical procedure and uh, this was the result we obtained and this is another case where there is a, a, a deficiency of the keratinized gingiva on the labial aspect and uh, during the exposure second stage surgery of the implant we have repositioned the gingiva apically and uh, you can see the uh, quality of the tissue that has been formed on the buccal aspect of the implant, labial aspect of the implant. So uh, again, there is good result. And this is another situation where uh, due to a ridge deficiency, we, we, two problems we had, there is a ridge deficiency and these tooth are supposed to be extracted, these are supposed to be extracted. And we have extracted this tooth and we have done the socket preservation and we have augmented the soft tissue here to compromise or to compensate the ridge deficiency with a connective tissue graft. And uh, you can see this is the result we obtained after six months. And you can see the exposed uh, uh, alveolar ridge, residual alveolar ridge, which is ready for implant placement. And you can see the inner side of the flap that is augmented with connective tissue. It is very thick and the texture is very good. So this will serve as a very good uh, uh, keratinized tissue, a tissue band on the label aspect of the implant, which will provide, which will provide enough uh, support and uh, uh, what you call that uh, safety to the survival of the implant in long-term basis. Now, let us see what are the techniques for soft tissue augmentation right now. What, all the, what, are, tech, what all techniques we have right now? Uh, we can categorize it. Broadly, we have coronally advanced flap, basic or standard coronally advanced flap with vertical incisions. It can be triangular, trapezoidal. It can be laterally moved coronally advanced flap. And it can be coronally advanced envelope flap without vertical incisions which can be done by a lateral approach and a frontal approach. And there are, of course, modifications of these coronally advanced envelope flaps, which I will mention later during the last part of my uh, presentation. So one group is coronally advanced flap. Second is free gingival graft. Free gingival graft, usually when we do free gingival graft, it is ideal for augmenting the gingiva apical to recession. If you want to achieve root coverage, you have to create the gingiva apical to recession or lateral to recession. And once it heals, you, have, you can displace it coronally or you can displace it laterally to achieve root coverage. So most of the times it is a two-stage procedure. And the third group of uh, procedure techniques available are uh, connective tissue grafts, bilaminar techniques and its variants. Uh, we have partially deepithelized or completely deepithelized connective tissue graft. You can uh, have full coverage of the connective tissue graft with the, uh, with the partial thickness flap or partial coverage. And you can have connective tissue graft with a laterally, coronally, or bipapillary displaced partial thickness flap. So these are the different options that we do with connective tissue. And finally, we have tunnel flaps and its modifications. What are the modifications? I will come to you. Uh, I, will, I, will get, I, will, I, will, I will be with that during the last part of my uh, presentation. And when you look into the evolution of tunnel flaps, there are a few techniques that has been evolved. One is PST, that is pinhole surgical technique by Kao et al. The other one is Vista, and the other one is Smile. So there are different uh, tunnel techniques that has been evolved. And now, presently, we have the most uh, refined tunnel technique for uh, which can predictably improve the outcome of plastic surgical procedures that we will discuss later. So these are the set of techniques that, is that are available right now for plastic surgical procedures around natural tooth and around implants. Now, let us see what are the key factors in choosing a technique. We have a lot of techniques. How will you choose a technique? If you follow the principles of evidence-based decision-making, let us go with that. First, you need to have a balanced data from literature. There should be some evidence before you choose a technique, whether it will result in partial root coverage, whether it will result in uh, complete root coverage. You should have a balanced data, high quality, 
uh, data from the uh, literature. So that has to be sought for first. Second is individual case situation. What is the type of recession? What is the phenotype of gingiva? These are very critical. And as far as possible, use adjacent tissue for augmentation. Prefer pedicle flaps than free grafts if possible. Consider mucogingival aesthetics because scars and keloids can negatively influence the outcome in terms of aesthetics because there are certain, certain uh, uh, procedures that results in scar formation. So that has, you have to address. And the, always consider the integration of color and thickness of the grafted site with the adjacent tissue. That's also important. Then try to treat all recession. If there are multiple recessions, try to treat all recessions in a single procedure, by a single procedure, if possible. So that is the second element. Then the experience of the clinician. Are you well equipped to do the procedure? Are you good in that technique? And whether you are good in minimally invasive surgical procedures, because that results in, that results in improvement of uh, clinical outcomes to a big level. So your experience you have to consider. And finally, patient-related outcome measures. That is very, very critical. What are the preferences of the patient? Are they ready for a double-stage procedure? Or are they ready to treat the recessions, multiple recessions in two stages? Or uh, what is their concern about the post-operative pain and discomfort? All these things should be included when you choose a technique from for plastic surgical procedures from the list I have mentioned in the previous slide. Now, what is the evidence? I will briefly brush through the evidence. I am not going to make you bored uh, talking about the evidence, uh, but I will, uh, for the information of the postgraduates, I will give you the best evidence that is available in the literature as far as I have referred uh, for your use. This is very useful. We have, uh, when you look for a highest level of evidence, we have to look for systematic review and meta-analysis as you say, as, as you know. So we have a meta-analysis meta systematic review uh, in 2003 which is based on ordinary data and individual patient data. That is very important, which is published in Journal of Periodontology in 2003. And for following that, a systematic review on gingival augmentation was a Cochrane review in 2009 by Leonard Shambron and Pini Prato. And later, following the AAP regeneration workshop of 2014, there was a systematic review that has been published in JP, Journal of Periodontology in 2015. And finally, in 2018, we have an updated Cochrane review which is actually an extension of the 2009 review conducted by the same people, Leonard Shambron and Pini Prato, which they have given the uh, results of that study. And most of the results, I am going to quote the results of this particular study, only the result. And this results of this particular study, as they mentioned in the article, is in alignment with or in line with the previous systematic reviews uh, that has been published, that I have been, that has, that has been uh, told. And that shows that the result of this particular review is reasonably good and dependable. This is the particular article which you can refer, which you can quote for your examination, which I am going to mention the results. You read only the uh, lines that is, uh, that is marked in red. So the result, uh, uh, to simplify it, connective tissue graft-based procedures provide better outcome. Subepithelial connective tissue graft with coronally advanced flap may be considered as the gold standard or reference standard in gingival augmentation. And results, I told you, the result of this 2018 review is in line, is in accordance with the results of previous systematic reviews. So that again gives you some credibility to the results. And uh, when you look into that, they have quoted that subepithelial connective tissue graft based procedures again provided better outcome. So that is very, very important. And they mentioned that there is limited data on aesthetic condition change uh, or related to the patient opinion. So there is a scope for developing a visual analog score to assess aesthetic condition change after gingival augmentation procedure. And there is no data on keratinized tissue augmentation around implants or prospective implant sites. And operator variability, the skill of the operator uh, in performing the technique is not addressed in many trials. And when you infer all this uh, information or conclusions, uh, we can uh, provide some uh, uh, light in the, for the scope of future research, the knowledge gaps that exist uh, at right now, based on this data. There is, if you look into the literature, uh, there is no data on laterally displaced flap. And we have limited information on free gingival graft on root coverage. Instead, free gingival graft is 
not considered as a standard of care for root coverage, but instead it is a good technique for increasing the width and thickness of the keratinized tissue, apical and lateral to the recession. And most of the systematic review and meta-analysis assessed the results based on tang intangible outcomes or surrogate outcomes. We have a positive in data on patient-related outcome measures and long-term stability of the result. This is very important. What is going to be the long-term stability of a gingival augmentation procedure is something that we have to address. Uh, I have gone through a recent article by uh, uh, British uh, Medical Health, Oral Health in 2021, and they have uh, given prior uh, importance to uh, the long-term stability. They have evaluated the long-term stability of the uh, root coverage or uh, keratinized tissue thickness and width that has been attained by uh, gingival augmentation for using uh, various techniques that I have listed you in the beginning. So that's a good article, 2021 article. Now, that's all about the evidence. So connective tissue based procedures are good. And we have uh, certain knowledge gaps that is existing, which we will need to address in the future by conducting proper trials. And how will you evaluate uh, the outcome of this uh, uh, augmentation procedure? There are two methods, as you know, we will evaluate either the surrogate outcome or intangible outcome, which is mainly based on the quantity of the gingiva or the soft tissue, the amount and the position of the gingiva. The other method is we can assess the true outcomes or tangible outcomes, uh, which actually is related to the quality of the, uh, of the gingiva, its appearance, its morphology, its function, and that is more patient related. So these are two means. Unfortunately, most of the times we will concentrate only on the surrogate outcomes. So that is what we see when you look into the literature. Things are changing slowly. So these are the, uh, what you call that, the, the, surrog the, the surrogate outcomes we look for after uh, when you evaluate the outcome of a, a plastic surgical procedure or an augmentation procedure. And these are the uh, uh, tangible outcomes we have to focus on later uh, in our trials. The aesthetics, the function, and the comfort of the patient should be addressed. Now let us see what are the critical factors that affects the outcome of uh, a soft tissue surgical procedure. There are three factors, as you all know. The first one is patient-related factors. The second one is site-related factors. And the third one is technique-related factors. Patient-related factors are uh, very important in choosing a technique. Uh, it doesn't come under the purview of my presentation today. So you just uh, hold it. There are patient-related factors which we need to address before we choose select a case. Second one is site-related factors. <laughs> that is also very important. We have to consider the type of recession the level of interdental support, the tooth position in the alveolus, gingival biotype, and the keratinized gingiva and the mucogingival junction lateral to recession. In the textbook of Gayavani Soshelli, it is very uh, repeatedly mentioned that whenever you do a gingival augmentation procedure, either for root coverage or augmenting the gingiva apical to recession, always consider the line of mucogingival junction in the adjacent tooth. Because if it is more apical, you are supposed to get a good band of keratinized gingiva. If it is the at keratinized gingiva is narrow or the mucogingival line is more coronal, the outcome of your augmentation procedure is going to be limited. So that is one parameter that is beautifully narrated in the textbook of uh, Sushelli, uh, which will give you some idea regarding the outcome of the procedure. So that is all about site related factors. Now, the third one is technique related factors, soft tissue handling. That is very, very important. And why I told you in the beginning, why? Because you may select the case properly, you may select the site properly, but we may end up in failure. So, what is the reason? Although there are reasons that are not in our control, the technique or the handling of soft tissues is purely in our control. What I want to uh, mention at this contest is. Uh, I hope uh, my PG guide Nandoma sir is here. Uh, we were during our post graduation days in Trivandrum way back in 1996 to 1999. Uh, I think more, many of the students of Nandoma sir will be here. Dr. Baiju will be here. Dr. Jose will be here. Mahesh, uh, Dr. Shibu, Dr. Roshni. I think many of them will be here. Uh, we have seen how sir handles the soft tissues. Actually, uh, personally speaking, I was uh, interested. I came interested in uh, plastic surgery, uh, the way uh, he handled the soft tissues, it was tremendous. So we were, uh, we were actually 
motivated to handle the soft issues in a better way from our mentor. So the soft issue handling is very critical. The point I am stressing is that even if you choose the case properly, if you don't handle the soft issues, your technique is not uh, up to the mark, the case will end up in failure or what uh, the people say, periodontal nightmares, it can happen if you don't handle the tissues proper. So that is going to be the crux of my presentation. And the technique related factors basically addresses two things. One is blood supply. You know, blood supply is critical because blood should reach the site to whatever uh, healing is to take place, blood should be there. So the blood supply of the graft and the flap is going to be critical. Second is wound stability. That is the clot stability. How you handle the clot uh, to be there to initiate the primary healing process is uh, very critical. So these are the two things that we have to consider when you mention about, when you, when you think about the technique related factors. And there are a lot of uh, parameters which will contribute or which will address these two, these two uh, major uh, uh, requirements in uh, proper wound healing. Now, the objective of all of us when you do a plastic surgery is uh, to obtain an uneventful primary wound healing. We need to have an uneventful primary wound healing. Then only we will say the outcome is good, the uh, procedure is successful. If you have that, the clinical outcome will be good. But to achieve an uneventful primary healing, the soft tissue healing, the handling or the technique during surgery should be, should be properly mastered. So that is very important. So I can say this is based on vascularity, wound stability and prevention of wound infection. I add one more thing to the previous slide. Apart from maintaining the blood supply, apart from protecting the clot, we have to prevent the post-operative wound infection also to result in uneventful primary healing, which ultimately will result in improvement of clinical outcome. So we can say that the soft tissue handling or the technique that you use for the procedure directly or at least close to directly affect the clinical outcome. So technique related factors are very, very critical. That is, this is the reason, this is the rationale uh, why I choose this particular topic to discuss with you. So three points, how to maintain vascularity, how to maintain wound stability, and how to prevent post-operative infection. What are things we can do for that? Let us see one by one, how to maintain vascularity. Before going to the, uh, the, the tips, you should see, you should understand the vascularity, the blood supply of gingiva anatomy. There are three independent sources. One is from the supraperiosteal vessels, as you can see. The other is one from uh, intraalveolar vessels, vessels emerging from the crest of the interdental septum. And the third one is from the vessels of the periodontal ligament. Of this, the supraperiosteal vessels remains the major supply of blood to the gingiva. There is something called a compensated blood supply. See, just imagine you are reflecting a flap for pocket therapy. Just imagine you are reflecting a full thickness flap. Okay. Now you are replacing the flap back into its original position. Once you reflect the flap, the blood supply of the flap is maintained by the supraperiosteal vessels, which is there in the flap. No other blood supply. When you replace the flap back, what happens is immediately there will be a compensated blood supply from the periodontal ligament. So that will, that will help the flap to survive during the initial healing period apart from the supraperiosteal blood supply, which is already there. Imagine one you, what happens when you reflect a flap from around an implant. When you reflect a flap around an implant, uh, definitely the flap is surviving with the blood supply from the supraperiosteal vessels. Now, imagine you, when you replace the flap back over the implant surface, there is no compensated blood supply from the periodontal ligament because there is no periodontal ligament space around an implant, as you know. So that is why this particular study by Bacart, Joss, and uh, Nicholas Lang has shown that Soft tissue surgeries around an implant will not give you as good a result as we obtain around natural tooth. That is because of the lack of compensated blood supply that is present. Again, this particular concept uh, stress the importance of blood supply in uh, improving the clinical outcome. Now, another area we have to consider is papilla, interdental gingiva or interdental papilla, because that is an area which is, uh, which is very dangerous to touch. Because uh, once you lose the papilla, the aesthetics is totally compromised. So we are the people who are supposed to handle the papilla very carefully. We need to know some uh, aspects, uh, anatomical aspects of hemo or hemodynamics of the papilla. 
papilla is the terminal end of gingival vasculature and naturally there will be a reduction in blood supply in the terminal end and not only that the connective tissue content of the papilla is very less because uh, there is outer gingival epithelium and sulcular epithelium on the either side so the connective tissue content is very less in the papilla and when you de epithelialize the papilla to receive a flap or a graft complete de epithelialization is usually difficult because of the lack of access even if you use proper instruments complete de epithelialization is not that much easy in the papilla so they, again that may negatively affect the outcome and uh, it, you know the maximum mechanical loading and microbial insert happens in the interdental area and it is the papilla that that suffers all this insult from the microbes and the mechanical loading so because of these negative factors uh, and because of the considering the significance of the papilla in aesthetics and function we have to handle the papilla very critically very carefully when you do a soft tissue surgery around natural tooth either natural tooth or around an implant now that is the importance of papilla when there is papilla the uh, dentition looks beautiful in aesthetics and function and when the papilla is lost it is always challenging for the clinician to regenerate the papilla as we all know papillary reconstruction procedures are uh, uh, will provide only varying results over a period of time uh, because uh, of the particular nature of that tissue now coming to the crux of my presentation uh, technique related factors are basically depend upon these factors how you design your flap how you plan your incisions how will you manage the thickness of the flap and how are you going to lengthen the flap lengthening what is flap flap lengthening i will come to that and the role of microsurgical approach that is also very critical in uh, improving the clinical outcome let us see first flap designs you know there are different types of flap designs there are semi lunar flaps there are triangular flaps there are trapezoidal flaps so this is a trapezoidal flap it's a triangular flap trapezoidal flap another trapezoidal flap submarginal and this is a uh, semi lunar flap and we have envelope flaps also where there is no vertical incision so based on the incision line we can have different types of flaps the basic rule is if you want to preserve the vascularity of the gingiva there should be minimum incisions and among these different outlines the envelope flap will give you the maximum blood supply whenever you place a vertical incision or another incision or a second vertical incision you are compromising the blood supply why we will come to that later so based on the outline there are different types of flap design and based on the composition there are two types of designs one is a full thickness flap as you know the other one is a partial thickness flap uh, briefly talking about the benefits the full thickness flap contains periosteum and the periosteum contains less number of elastic fibers so you cannot stretch the periosteum the full thickness flap because of the presence of the periosteum but partial thickness flap doesn't contain periosteum and uh, you can very easily stretch or displace the partial thickness flap uh, to any extent if you want because it doesn't contain periosteum uh, uh, that is the basic difference and based on the displacement you can we can have displaced flap and undisplaced flap and basically repositioned or displaced flaps can be rotational or advanced so these are the different flap designs we will employ in our plastic surgical procedures now what about incisions we use horizontal incision we use vertical incision we use oblique incision to outline our flaps different types of incision we use the basic rule is always place the incision on a firm tissue don't attempt to place an incision on a inflamed tissue that stress the importance of proper phase 1 therapy or initial therapy the tissue should be free of inflammation to place an incision so that is very very critical ba going back to basics now incisions at the flap margins are very critical that is why some people prefer sub marginal incisions if possible because in the margin you have reduced vascularity you have narrow gingiva you have interdental papilla the black triangle gets exposed so everything is uh, uh, crucial in the margins of the flap so incisions in the flap margins are very critical avoid beveling in the margins as much as possible if you want to make an incision for a plastic surgical procedure uh, place it i am not talking about pocket therapy flaps Uh, you place a incision horizontally so that the thickness of the gingiva is maintained flap is maintained and whenever possible whenever possible always use circular incisions rather than beveled incisions i am not telling you that internal bevel incision is bad modified widman flap is bad it is good it is a beautiful incision and personally speaking i i tell you internal bevel incision is the best incision that i have gone across 
in in uh, in any surgery surgery that we do inside the mouth because if you are good enough to place a beautiful internal bevel incision during your surgery you are good you have mastered the surgical procedure well because it is uh, something that demands high technique and skill to perform a proper internal bevel incision but the problem with internal bevel incision is it will reduce the thickness of the flap it will in, that is very critical in plastic surgical procedures especially around implants and uh, also it will bevel the flap margins so you can use internal bevel incisions if it is indicated if you want to reduce the thickness of the tissue if you want to restore the scalloping outline of the gingival margin you can place an internal bevel incision nothing wrong in that but as much as possible from a uh, plastic surgical point of view or when a healing point of view try to use horizontally place the incisions horizontally avoid beveling and as far as possible if you are reflecting a flap uh, use a para use a para margin incisions or, or use circular incisions instead of para margin incisions now one thing i want to tell you you might be knowing the terminal capillaries of the gingiva is running in an oblique direction antero posteriorly or postero anteriorly in an oblique direction means your distally like this somewhere you see here it runs like this so if you place a vertical incision ultimately you are cutting the blood supply capillaries so that is why they say that vertical incision can result in reduction of vascularity of the flap that you are reflecting so avoid vertical incision because of this reason and other rules you know never place a vertical incision in the mid root region never place a vertical incision cutting splitting the papilla and always try to place the vertical incision on the line angle of the labial and interproximal surface of the gingiva and uh, extend the vertical incision beyond the mucous gingival junction all these things are you already know and whenever you expose the edentulous ridge try to place mid crestal incisions as much as possible rather than remote incisions remote incisions are always a choice but if possible try to place mid crestal incisions you have to place we mean we have to place remote incisions if you want to displace the flap if you want to increase the keratinized gingiva on the buccal aspect it is there but uh, the basic rule is try to place crestal incisions in edentulous sites if you expose it for implant placement now the vertical incisions if you place uh, uh, when you reflect a flap it should be broader on the flap should be broader on the base so that the base of the flap will provide you the blood supply so it has to be broader than the uh, uh, what do you call that than the width of the flap and uh, uh, flap it is said that flap without vertical incision or surface incision carries more vascular network so that is a problem of vertical incision with uh, regarding the vascularity now coming to flap thickness flap thickness is very important because the if the flap is sufficiently thick it contains more vasculature it can it have more vascular content stable vascular content so try to maintain the thickness of the flap there are full thickness flap and partial thickness flap always full thickness flap is better in terms of the vascular content but the problem of uh, full thickness flap it is not amenable for displacement or it is not amenable for lengthening so you have to reflect a partial thickness flap you can reflect a partial thickness flap only in situations where you don't find any vital structure within the gingival mucosa so in that situation you can reflect a partial thickness flap because partial thickness flap has more mobility it has less flap tension it provides a good vascular bed for the graft and uh, there are a lot of benefits for that so even if you are reflecting a partial thickness flap make it as thick as possible dissect the flap close to the periosteum make it as thick as possible and it is said that it is the incision that you place in the beginning is going to influence the thickness of your flap so again the placement of incisions are very critical now we come to flap lengthening or displacement see many times when you do a plastic surgery either for augmentation or root coverage we have to displace the flap either coronally laterally or apically so that is called displacement of the flap and that we call it lengthening of the flap also we cannot uh, displace a flap without lengthening the flap without stretching the flap and the basically the displacement depends upon the proper release of the flap you have to release the flap properly from the underlying structures so that is very very critical why flap lengthening to achieve a tension free primary closure for after augmentation you have to lengthen the flap to restore the soft tissue architecture in the coronal aspect you have to lengthen the flap to denude the cover to cover the denuded roots or implants you have to lengthen the flap so there are many reasons for lengthening the flap and the distance of flap lengthening is going to be very critical 
because if you lengthen the flap more if you stretch the flap more the vascularity is going to be compromised so again the distance to which you have to lengthen the flap depends upon the outline of the flap the outline of the flap uh, the vascularity of the flap depends upon the outline and incisions of the flap so all these factors are related so you have to consider all these things the outline of the flap the incisions the thickness of the flap and the method of lengthening the flap to improve the clinical outcomes all these things are related now a lengthened flap should remain passively on the bone margin without any sutures before you attempt the suture you have to place the flap passively you have to flap the flap over the foot bone margin and it should remain passively in the bone margin that is one requirement major requirement and the uh, it is said that in milton study it is very very long but he said that uh, it is a general rule the base of the flap that the the ratio between the length to width of the flap should be 2 is to 1 that is the base of the flap should be broader than the length of the flap whenever you lengthen the flap vascularity is going to decrease so always keep it in mind now we need to displace the flap or lengthen the flap to different extents we for the purpose of uh, understanding the process we can categorize into if you want to di uh, displace the flap for 3 mm there are certain techniques if you want to lengthen the flap 3 uh, to 6 mm there are certain techniques and if you want to lengthen the flap more than 7 mm there are certain techniques we will see one by one if you want to display the flap minimally less than 3 mm you just need to elevate a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap extend it beyond the mucogingival junction and in the apical part you can give a partial thickness extension because partial thickness flap in the apical aspect of the envelope flap always give you better mobility okay so you can take a mucoperiosteal flap without vertical incision envelope flap extend it beyond the mucogingival junction and make a partial thickness extension beyond the mucogingival junction that will provide you adequate displacement up to 3 mm so that is the rule provided there is no vital structures in the alveolar mucosa always keep it in mind then only you need to place a partial thickness incision so that is that you have to consider now if you want to make moderate displacement 3 to 6 mm you have to place vertical incisions either 1 mm one vertical incision or two vertical incisions and there is another incision you can see here in the photograph in the picture one vertical incision second vertical incision and you can see Uh, another releasing incision which you call the periosteal releasing incision on the inner side of the flap and for displacing the flap you can they say that you can place either one periosteal releasing incision and you can place a second periosteal incision releasing incision apical to that if you need more displacement and if you want still further displacement you can insert a hemostat between the periosteal incision and you can stretch the periosteum on the either side that will give you little more flap mobility so these are the different techniques by which you can mobilize the flap you can lengthen the flap and by doing this you will get uh, mobility up to 3 to 6 mm as per literature and if you want to displace the flap more suppose if you are doing a what you call that a, uh, uh, a laterally displaced coronally advanced flap if you are doing a, a socket preservation if you are doing a what you call that implant side development either soft tissue or with hard tissue uh, you have to displace the flap extensively more than 7 mm so in that apart from all these techniques you can use some other thing that is what we call that uh, you have to dissect you can dissect the the flap deeper into the mucosa that will give you little more mobility but always you have to consider the anatomical structures that is present that is very important but you can dissect the flap deeper into the mucosa for the mobility and you can use a cutback incisions that you which commonly do uh, in when you do a laterally displaced coronally advanced flap and you can place some other horizontal incisions also to displace the flap so these are the techniques by which you can uh, uh, displace a flap for more than 7 mm you can see here the cutback incision and there are supplemental techniques even with all these techniques if you cannot displace the flap properly to the achieved desired level you can use the palatal tissue because if you are displacing we are displacing only the uh, buccal flap no we are displacing the buccal flap and if you are not able to get a primary closure you can use a pedicle connective tissue from the palate that is what they say provided if the palatal mucosa is greater than greater than 4 mm you can use a pedicle flap from the palate the connective tissue pedicle from the palate and you can displace it uh, buccally and you can approximate the buccal flap with that palatal pedicle connective tissue to uh, uh, to achieve primary closure 
and that avoids a lot of other drawbacks of trap lengthening that will come uh, that I will mention in the next slide. I will show you this photograph. It is taken from the article. I have mentioned the article here. Uh, they are going for a, a extensive heart tissue augmentation in this implant site, prospective implant site. They have reflected a full thickness plug with vertical incisions and they have uh, placed a cutback incision. See, this is a periosteal releasing, not cutback, periosteal releasing incision with a blade on the inner side of the plug. And uh, they, have, they are stretching the periosteum on the uh, either side uh, with a hemostat. And that will provide uh, uh, some amount of mobility to the flap so that, and because the primary uh, requirement uh, following uh, a augmentation procedure, whether it is a socket preservation or heart tissue augmentation or soft tissue augmentation, we should achieve primary closure. That is a basic rule. If there is primary closure, you are not going to achieve the desired result, desired outcome. So uh, they got a, a reasonably good mobility and they have placed the bone, they have screwed it and they have sutured it. So this is how you place a periosteal releasing incision and they say you can do one or more periosteal releasing incisions to get better mobility. And there are certain problems we come across when you do flap lengthening procedure. If you, are, if you have done enough uh, plastic surgical procedures, displaced flaps, you might have come across these problems. Uh, and a few of the photographs, many of the photographs that I am going to show you, except a very few, are the photographs of my personal cases. Uh, but few I have uh, resorted to standard textbooks and journals, which I have mentioned uh, in that particular slide itself. So what are the problems related to lengthening the flap? The first problem is related to the vertical incision. Between, because the vertical incision compromises the vascularity and there is an aesthetic impairment when you place a vertical incision, keloid formation or scar formation will be there. Although it is said that oral tissues, intraoral tissues rarely scar, there is a scope for scar formation. It is basically, it is not as uh, amenable for scarring as the skin, that's all. But there is tendency for scarring that you can see. Here you can see uh, 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 a cutback incision is given and vertical incisions are given and you can see the healing. You can see the uh, unesthetic appearance, the scar that has been formed in the place of vertical and that oblique incisions. So always consider this, think about this before you place a vertical incision. But if the vertical incision is mandatory for the outcome of the procedure, you have to place a vertical incision, no choice for that. So you have to base the balance, the risk and the benefit. Whatever procedure we do, there are risks, there are benefits. Always we choose the technique based or uh, considering the balance between the risk and the benefit. That is applicable to all field of medicine. Even if you prescribe a drug, there is a risk, there is a benefit, which is more, uh, uh, more, more, more uh, beneficial, which is more uh, uh, what you need, which one you need more. Based on that, you have to, you have to choose the technique. So consider this. And the next problem uh, related to flap lengthening is, uh, one is, Lengthening the flap, as I told you, it will reduce the vascularity. Second thing, once you displace the flap coronally, naturally the, the vestibular depth is going to decrease. You will note this when you do, when you have done any coronally advanced flap, you will notice this, that vestibular depth is going to decrease. And the third thing is, you can see in the picture, uh, the buccal aspect or the labial aspect where you displace the flap will be mainly having non keratinized tissue, alveolar mucosa or vestibular mucosa. So these are the three things we will end up when you displace a flap coronally because the keratinized tissue, whatever remaining, once it is stretched coronally, it will occupy the alveolar region or the most coronal part. And the majority of the buccal flap will be left out with non keratinized tissue. And the mucogingival junction, you can see that mucogingival junction will get altered, you can see. This is the mucogingival line of the displaced flap. And this is the original mucogingival line in relation to the adjacent side. So the mucogingival line get, get displaced. So that is a drawback. And you will end up lot of keratinized, uh, non-keratinized tissue in the buccal aspect. And uh, you may have to go for an augmentation, keratinized tissue augmentation later to provide stability for your implant or stability for your uh, site, prospective implant site. So we will end up in such a calamity when we displace the flap buccally to a bigger extent. So that is a problem. These are the problems related to flap lengthening. Now we have, uh, I, have uh, I have described uh, what are the things you want to do uh, to improve vascularity based on flap design, incisions, thickness of the flap and lengthening the flap. And there are other few techniques. Have you heard, the, heard of this slogan, measure twice and cut once? Who will do that? Usually, in carpentry and in tailoring work. That is what I have seen. 
they will measure many times and they will place the cut because if they err in that if they go wrong somewhere they will lose the commodity so you have to measure twice before you place the cut and this is the first rule that you have to keep in your mind when you place incisions on the gingiva measure twice plan it well plan your incision then you place the incision and all the incisions should be done with sharp single stroke don't try to place multiple incisions in the same site single stroke sharp blade proper instrument with a single stroke you have to cut and handle the tissues as atraumatically as possible and if possible use the principles of microsurgery that will minimize the the trauma to the tissue and once you do all these there is very less trauma to the soft tissue there is no chance for microthrombosis there is no chance for a vascular collapse the healing will be better primary healing will be better clinical outcome will be better so always keep it in mind when you do when you place the incision right from placing the incision it is very significant now we come to the next aspect wound stability how you maintain the wound stability wound stability is the ability to maintain the clot without breaking in the soft tissue hard tissue junction which will prevent microbial contamination how you stabilize the clot because the wound stability that you expect following a pocket therapy after replacing a flap on the avascular root surface or implant is something different from what we achieve following a plastic surgery because the clot is formed most of the times over the recipient vascular bed in plastic surgery but in pocket therapy it is formed on the avascular root surface it is more complicated so the size of the clot beneath the graft or the flap in periodontal plastic surgery is very very critical any disturbance in wound stability or loss of clot will result in reduced tensile strength of the wound dehiscence of the wound facilitation of epithelial downgrowth and inviting microbial contamination all these will negatively affect the outcome of the procedure so maintaining wound stability of the initial clot initial fibrin adhesion is critically critical in periodontal plastic and implant surgery let us see what are the factors that decides wound stability proper primary closure simply primary closure is not enough there should be tension free primary closure simply tension free primary closure is not enough there should be tension free primary closure at the margins because if you don't release the flap as you see here it will result in mouse holding of the flap so flap should be well very well released and very properly lengthened to prevent tension free closure at the margins mouse holding is a particular technique that is used by uh, uh, soldiers in their war you can read it is there in the wikipedia the same thing the same concept will happen here if you improperly release the flap now a tension free closure at the margins is not enough there should be passive flap adaptation and pass passive flap displacement and uh, proper release of the flap is very significant and that should be uh, you should ensure proper release during the design stage of the flap itself so these are the factors that decides wound stability now what is the significance of primary closure when there is primary closure there is smooth margins margin flaps are well vascularized it is tension free it is precisely adapted and hence we will get a primary intention healing and we will get the proper natural architecture of the tissue the restoration of the tissue will be normal as per the normal tissue so that is the advantage of primary closure if you don't have a primary closure the margins will be irregular there will be restricted blood supply tension in the bone margin all these will result in secondary intention healing and that results in scar volume defect and uh, other uh, fibrotic tissue and all those things so primary closure is very important for wound stability i will show you this is passive flap adaptation the flap is displaced lengthened and it is adapted without sutures passively here the graft is passively adapted this is an exercise you have to do when you do a plastic surgery you have to place the flap or graft in the desired position which you expect uh, where it should be after the procedure and it should be it should remain there free without any mobility once you pull the lip once you pull the surrounding tissue it should remain free that is very important and when you do a connective tissue graft uh, after placing the connective stabilizing the connective tissue uh, usually we replace the partial thickness flap over the connective tissue and it should remain passively over the connective tissue like this then only you should go for sutures and i told you i will i will, I will give you another tip uh, when you suture the uh, partial thickness flap coronally to cover the connective tissue completely Uh, there will be some amount of uh, uh, displacement of a mucogingival junction coronally and there will be a reduction in vestibular depth in such situations uh, you can use this particular suture this is called a horizontal stress breaking suture from the adjacent uh, healthy sites you can take the bite 
and you can press the base of the flap towards the bone so that this part of the flap the flap the whole flap will remain tension free the movement of the perioral muscles tissues will not interfere with the healing of the flap so this is a particular suturing technique you can employ horizontal stress breaking suture in areas where the vestibular depth is not going to be adequate okay so this is another thing that you can keep in mind you can see the horizontal stress breaking suture here now when you do a socket preservation you have to advance the flap a lot you can see the buccal vestibular depth is reduced and the mucogingival line you can see it is displaced coronally in the surgical site but there are certain situations you cannot do this because in the anterior region if you displace this flap because i told you in socket preservation you should get a primary closure if you attempt primary closure here in the anterior aesthetic zone you will have to displace the flap the whole keratinized tissue buccally that is not possible because the bone is remaining here so you cannot displace the flap even if you put a vertical incision whatever you do it is very difficult but you should achieve primary closure also what you should do after socket grafting you can go for a socket shielding with a free gingival graft a piece of free gingival graft you can take it from the pallet and you can seal the socket like this okay so that the primary closure is achieved and the labial keratinized tissue is not altered or not compromised so that is you can see here uh, we have done a connective tissue graft for soft tissue augmentation here and we have been done a socket shield with a free gingival graft and the primary closure has been achieved in both sides so achieving primary closure by any means by proper judi scientific means is very mandatory to improve the clinical outcome you can see the socket sh uh, shield that socket uh, it has been covered with a free gingival graft no if still nothing is possible you have to get a primary closure you cannot do a socket uh, shield with a free gingival you cannot you cannot do a socket uh, cover with a free gingival graft you cannot ad advance the buccal flap uh, beyond a limit you can resort to palatal palatal pedicles that is what i told you you can reflect a palatal pedicle connective tissue and you can approximate this connective tissue margin with your buccal flap margin even that is possible anyway obtaining primary closure is very mandatory for wound stability now we come to the third part we have finished vascularity we have finished wound stability the third thing is how to prevent wound infection there are two things that uh, invite wound infection one is the resistance of the host the second factor is the fact there are certain factors that is always already present in the site that is the factors that promote wound infection in all surgical site and the host resistance we don't have any control on that and uh, there are two factors that promotes infection these are one set of factors and uh, resistance of host tissues the fibrous content the nature of tissue all these are very relevant the genetic uh, pattern of the tissue Ex again we don't have any control here but we have good control in our technique we have good control over this the bacterial wound count should be minimal see intraoral wounds are clean contaminated wounds usually they are not clean wounds they are clean contaminated wounds so the bacteria will be there the bacterial count should be less so we have to do it in a very sterile way in the proper way and don't allow any circulatory collapse don't compromise blood supply don't injure the flap or the wound avoid dead space or foreign bodies because all these things which is purely under our control control of the, tech, uh, the 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 clinician surgeon should not interfere with the outcome so immunity we can't do much resistance of the tissue, tissue we can't do much but we have good control here so do proper attention you give proper proper attention to these aspects and that will naturally that will prevent wound infection so we have discussed all the three factors how to maintain vascularity critical factors how to maintain wound stability and how to maintain how to prevent wound infection so we have men, uh, discussed that and let us see how we can incorporate these principles to the various steps we do in a plastic surgical procedure these are the critical steps we do in a plastic surgery in a in gingival augmentation we will prepare the recipient bed we will procure the donor tissue and we will immobilize or transfer and immobilize the donor tissue at the recipient bed and the vascularity and immobilization of the donor tissue is going to be critical now what are the considerations in recipient bed preparation i told you we have to prepare a partial thickness recipient bed you have to dissect as close to the periosteum and you have to remove all the epithelial tags and all the muscles that is that will be present here when you prepare the recipient bed because when there are muscle fibers or epithelial tags that will interfere with the uh, healing it will make it mobile the graft mobile 
Not only that, it will uh, act as a foreign body beneath the graft. So healing will be impaired. So the preparation of the recipient site is very, very critical. It should be, you make it as close to the periosteum. Don't reflect the periosteum. Make it as close to the periosteum. Remove all epithelial tags and make it free of any movable elastic muscle tissues. And if you are doing a free gingival graft, the, uh, the, the deflected epithelial, partial thickness flap can be removed. Or it can be it can be retained and can be secured apical to the free gingival graft. That is going to be difficult. Usually we cut it off. Once you reflect it and once you prepare the uh, recipient, but we cut the partial thickness flap we have reflected. Now, after placing the connective tissue, if you are doing a connective tissue graft, after placing the connective tissue, you have to use this partial thickness flap to completely cover the connective tissue here. And even you can use a horizontal stress breaking suture following all the principles. So that's all about the recipient side considerations. What are the donor side considerations? Usually palatal uh, gingiva is considered as a donor site because it provides you the best tissue. And there are different types of palate. Make an assessment on the palate, whether it's a shallow palatine vault, average palatine vault, or a deep palatine vault. And the site from which you are taking the donor tissue should be free of uh, any sort of clinical attachment loss. That is very important. And uh, this is very significant. The major, major anatomical landmark we come across is the greater palatine nerve and vessels. And it is said that Literature has shown that usually the greater palatine vessels emerge from the greater palatine foramen located 1 to 1.5 centimeters apical to the uh, cemento enamel junction of second between the second and uh, third molar and it runs anteriorly uh, at about between 7 to 17 millimeters. This is very important 7 to 17 millimeters. So in shallow palatine vault, so the average is 12. Usually you assume that the greater palatine nerves and vessels are running at about 12 millimeters from the cemento enamel junction. But in a shallow palatine vault, it will be close to seven. It will be more coronal. But if it is a deep palatine vault, it will be more apical, it will be close to 17. So you need to assess it like that. Be depending upon the palatine vault, the position will change. But uh, uh, Moreover, uh, whatever it be, it will be somewhere between 7 and 17 millimeters. Keep it in mind. And uh, the anterior palate consists of a fatty zone and the posterior palate consists of glandular zone. It is always better to have fatty zone, uh, rather, uh, sorry, uh, uh, glandular zone to have uh, uh, a free gingival graft. And you have to, only thing is you have to remove all the glandular tissue from the beneath the, uh, beneath the graft. And uh, when you procure a connective tissue graft in the article by Otto Zur, it is said that uh, try to procure the connective tissue from the anterior fatty zone because unlike, unlike uh, the, the free gingival graft, the thickness of the connective tissue you require is very less. So try to secure it, procure it from the fatty zone. Anyway, your uh, donor site should be somewhere between the distal aspect of the canine and the mesial aspect of the first molar. Avoid fatty zone in general and avoid the rugue area, especially if you are taking a free gingival graft because it becomes unaesthetic after healing. Now, uh, if you are doing a connective tissue graph, the donor site, uh, whatever technique you do, either a trapdoor or a window approach, uh, you can, uh, you are safe because we can uh, primarily close the uh, donor site with uh, the partial thickness flap. So the chance for bleeding is less, healing will be good when you go for a connective tissue graph. But there is a problem when you do a free gingival graph. All, you, all these things you might be practicing, but just for a completion sake, I am mentioning this. Either you can use a acrylic stent to support the clot, or you can use PRF to support the clot. You can use PRF with sutures, supporting sutures, or you can use other agents like uh, Abgel or Oxycel or Surgicel uh, to seal the wound. And over these all additive materials, you can place the acrylic stent to stabilize it more. So you can be more safe. Uh, you, you, you need not think about, you need not worry about the bleeding. Uh, if you employ these things judiciously, we are pretty safe. Uh, we won't encounter any bleeding from the donor side. But in cases, uh, then let us see how you how you handle the soft tissues. See the ideal thickness of a graft, a free gingival graft is they say 1.5 millimeters and it corresponds with the bevel of a number 15 BP blade. So when you take the graft from the palatal side, you just consider the thickness, the, the bevel, how well, how deep the bevel is going. So that will give you a fair idea regarding how far you should dissect. And trim out all glandular and fatty tissue from the graft, obtain a smooth, even regular connective tissue surface. Reduce the in vitro time, transfer immediately as early as possible. So you have to prepare the recipient bed first before you take the donor tissue. Then place the periosteal surface of the flap over the periosteum. Don't make it ultra. 
keep the periosteal surface to the periosteum over the periosteum and the, keep the coronal aspect coronal as much as possible so what i do is when i strip the free gingival graft i place a suture on the coronal aspect of the flap so that i can strip the graft very easily by pulling the suture and also at the same time i will get a fair idea which part is coronal so that is that will serve you as a guide a guide in deciding which part is a coronal and which part is a pike and ideally speaking this is the cross section of the tissue this is the tissue which we make when you use a free gingival graft and this is the thickness of the connective tissue graft or of course the thickness of the connective tissue graft will be less than the free gingival graft and uh, there will be some amount of glandular tissue avoid this glandular tissue completely trim it out so that the margin the inner aspect of the graft should be very free very even and smooth make it like that before you place it avoid all the submucosal structures so the graft surface should be smooth now can we place a graft over the denuded bone there is a question whether you need to place on the uh, partial thickness bed graft bed remaining or whether we need to place directly over the bone nothing wrong in placing a graft over the bone but the advantages are the shrinkage will be less when you place it directly over the bone and it will be more firm because there are no movable tissues in the recipient bed but the problem is there is a compromise in the vascularity from the graft bed because in the when you place it directly over the bone there is no blood supply there is cortical bone so what they say is if you are supposed to place it over the bone you can decorticate the cortical plate and then you can place the graft over the bone if you are uh, if you are equipped with that you can do that but whenever possible uh, uh, it should be placed over a partial thickness flap but there are certain situations suppose if you reflect a full thickness flap the periosteum get detached from the bone you have to place the flap graft over the bone in that situation you can do a decortication you can induce bleeding and you can place the graft over the bone directly free gingival graft i mean now how you immobilize the flap <clears throat> proper sutures you know a close adaptation of the graft bed graft with the graft bed is mandatory you have to reduce the dead space or size of the clot you can use stretching sutures mesial and distal to the graft that usually i don't do that but you can use stretching sutures on the either side of the flap i why i don't do that because uh, i am not uh, a proponent of that because i don't believe in penetrating the graft with uh, needle because whenever you penetrate a soft tissue graft with needle once it heals there will be sloughing of the tissue up to 1 to 1.5 mm so again we will lose the tissue so as much as possible if you can stretch the graft even by other means you avoid piercing through the graft as much as possible that is my humble suggestion then you can uh, you have to apply pressure over the graft that is very important and finally before placing the sutures you have to check the passive adaptation of the graft or the flap that is also important and uh, the initial fibrin fibrin clot attachment is very significant for the passive filtration of the nutrients during the early phase of healing for the survival of the graft so this part is going to be very very important so the period of 24 hours after graft placement is going to be critically critical in connective tissue graft uh, uh, we have to suture the graft first stabilize the sutures with absorbable sutures then we have to cover the connective tissue graft with the partial thickness flap and when you suture the partial thickness flap stabilize the partial thickness flap over the connective tissue it should cover the connective tissue completely that will give you better outcome studies have shown that and once you do that your needle should not disturb the underlying connective tissue it should you should take the bite only engaging the outer partial thickness flap that is going, that is very critical otherwise it will displace the connective tissue and the donor side uh, when you do a connective tissue graft donor side you can cover it with a partial thickness flap so there is nothing wrong nothing nothing problematic in that and usually we can use different types of sutures uh, i used to do uh, uh, horizontal sutures i don't give a stretching suture and i used to give compressive intra periosteal x x sling sutures like this from the periosteum and the apical area and you can use holbrook ocean bean sutures in between to get a contour to stretch the graft as per the shape of the uh, gingiva attached gingiva you can contour the graft by using holbrook ocean bean sutures this might you might be doing all these things and this is important in the eventuality of an unforeseen complication bleeding from the donor side what you should do first you should assess the bleeding source and you can give one or two compressive sutures between the bleeding site and the location of the greater palatine foramen bleeding the bleeding site and the greater palatine foramen you can give a compressive suture incorporating the 
greater palatine artery where uh, you uh, where you uh, decide where it is you can give a compressive suture it will stop the bleeding still if it is not stopping you can go for a cauterization of the blood vessel still if it is not useful you can you have to ligate the vessel after elevating a full thickness palatal flap identify the artery identify the bleeding point uh, ligate the vessel uh, distal to the bleeding point so uh, fortunately in my experience i have not uh, uh, come across much bleeding but i have encountered a bleeding and it has stopped with this compressive sutures fortunately uh, uh, these uh, methods were uh, not uh, uh, I, I am supposed to I, I was not uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately uh, I was uh, uh, comfortable with this compressive sutures it doesn't uh, proceed to a major complication so the thing I want to uh, uh, tell you is that you need an electrocautery you need uh, uh, specialize your skills to ligate the vessel uh, I don't I do I don't think many of the periodontists are good in ligating the vessels you need uh, to master that technique whenever uh, you get uh, some other chance uh, because it may happen uh, very rarely so you have to be aware of that now that completes the uh, uh, soft tissue handling we have uh, uh, i have discussed uh, about flap designs incisions flap thickness uh, methods of flap lengthening problems of flap lengthening how to maintain the wound stability and uh, how to incorporate these small tips and tricks in recipient bed preparation donor site management and immobilization of the graft. Now, these are the two things that we are not overlooked because these are two things that also affect the outcome. Operator skill, that is very important and the psychological stress of the patient. And there are a lot of articles when I went through the literature, there are a lot of articles which has addressed the psychological stress of the patient during the procedure will have a negative impact on the outcome. There are a lot of studies. Uh, the articles that I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, there are a lot of studies mentioned in that article itself, in the narrative review. So these are the two areas which are not addressed. Uh, all the other things, technique related factors, we can, we can uh, improve and there need to have more studies on operator variability, skill variability in improving the outcome. Now, I am going to the last part of my presentation. What are the different paradigm shifts we have seen, we have seen over a period of time? And what is the present status of flap designs in periodontal plastic surgery? See, uh, whatever procedure we do at that point, at one point of time, we'll have its own demerits. So once you identify the demerit, we will go for a new procedure or a new technique. That is how it comes. So to overcome the limitations and to improve the aesthetic and functional outcome, there has been different flap designs that has evolved over a period of time. Let us see what they are. What they are. Right from the time of Raitske, Ellen, Sablagui, Azzi, Otto Zur et al., Kao, Sushelli and De Sanctis, and Zur and Sushelli, they, they have proposed different flap designs, right from an envelope design, a multiple envelope design with vertical incision, without vertical incision. So a lot of flap designs has been evolved. Just like how original Widman became modified Widman, just how Takei's Papilla preservation became tonity and, and uh, cortellini simplified and modified pres uh, preservation flap. We have standard coronally advanced flap, envelope coronally advanced flaps, coronally advanced envelope flaps, standard and coronally advanced envelope flaps with and without connective tissue graft, modified split full split coronally advanced flap with connective tissue graft. That is a modification by Socially and DeSanctis. Modification of coronally advanced flap by Socially and DeSanctis. I will, I, will, I will describe this procedure later. And finally, we have tunnel flaps and modified split, full split tunnel flaps with coronally connective tissue graft. Modification of by Socially and Zur. So these are the different flap designs we have right now in plastic surgery. So this is a modification of coronally advanced flap by socially and desanctis. There is no vertical incision, but there are oblique papillary incisions. And these papillary incisions are made to create a surgical papilla. They are creating a surgical papilla and they are de-epithelializing this existing natural papilla and they are rotating and displacing the flap coronally after placing the connective tissue uh, to achieve root coverage or improving the aesthetics and the function. But in Modified tunnel flap, I mean modified tunnel flap, not Vista, not Cavos PST, not Smile, 
in modified tunnel flap there is no vertical incision there is no surface incision at all only tunneling the papilla is not disturbed at all and there is no oblique incisions only the tunnel so that is the these are the two flap designs you can use uh, uh, right now to uh, do gingival augmentation even for multiple resections and i told you split full split both these designs originally it was mentioned by suchelli and disanctis in this design they have made a split thickness design here in the coronal aspect and the, in the middle of the flap they have gone for a full thickness flap and in the apical part they have gone for a split thickness flap this split full split concept has been transferred by otto zur et al in their modified tunnel technique the most coronal end of the flap is split the middle part of the flap is full full thickness and the apical part is split thickness so what is the advantage i will tell you the split thickness of the coronal part will will preserve the <coughs> sorry will preserve the interdental papilla it won't disturb the interdental papilla the full thickness flap in the middle will retain the thickness of the flap at the same time it will maintain the vascularity primary vascular supply that is from the supra periosteal vessels in the middle part that is why they made it full thickness and the apical part it is split thickness again and that will help you in the mobilization of the flap so all the three concepts has been incorporated in both these techniques and uh, uh, the split thickness full thickness split thickness design is very favorable to improve the clinical outcome at the same time it will provide you sufficient uh, coronal displacement also so that is the thing now where do we stay now where do we stay now we have three techniques one is standard coronally advanced procedure coronally advanced flap with vertical incisions and this is usually done for single tooth resections more than 3 mm of resection then we have modified coronally advanced flap design which i mentioned about oblique incisions split full split thickness design by suchelli and disantis that is applicable in cases where there are multiple resections multiple shallow resections less than 3 mm and it should be done by a microsurgical approach that is the second set third set is tunnel flap without vertical incision without surface incisions with connective tissue graft by otto zur and suchelli and it is indicated in multiple shallow resections less than 3 mm and it has got extended applications in implant uh, surgical sites also and it should be attempted preferably with a microsurgical approach so these are the three flap designs we have uh, based on the uh, scientific concept of better clinical outcomes the standard coronally advanced flap with vertical incisions is still there it is not obsolete because if you have a single tooth resection more than 3 mm of resection you cannot do a tunnel flap or you cannot do a modified coronally rotated flap you have to resort to a uh, standard coronally advanced flap either triangular or trapezoidal with vertical incisions so these are the three techniques we have right now now this is the standard coronally advanced flap and this is the modified coronally advanced flap with oblique incisions uh, creating a surgical papilla they are creating a surgical papilla and this is the tunnel flap without any surface incisions now what are the drawbacks of standard coronally advanced flap i told you there are vertical incisions and there will be displacement of the mucogingival junction there will be increased volume of non keratinized tissue so all these are the drawbacks of standard coronally advanced flap to overcome these uh, uh, drawbacks there came envelope flap and modified coronally advanced flap without vertical incision with or without connective tissue graft so what are the drawbacks of modified coronally advanced flap without vertical incisions it will alter the papillary hemodynamics because you create a surgical papilla and keep it in mind when you create a surgical papilla instead of natural papilla it is the weakest point in the flap it will affect the stabilization of the coronally advanced flap so when you create a surgical papilla it is going to be the weakest part so that should be taken care of that is one drawback of modified coronally advanced flap and it is difficult to get a primary closure interdentally uh, with the surgical papilla and the suture technique you employ to displace the uh, gingival papillary complex coronally over the surgical papilla is also going to be difficult these are the drawbacks of the suchelli disanctis modification of coronally advanced flap now to overcome these modifications there came the modified tunnel flap by otto zur these are the advantages superior aesthetic outcome no surface incisions no surgical papilla natural papilla is not disturbed 
there is a split full split design which will facilitate a greater flap thickness in the middle and better flap mobilization apically and the papilla is not disturbed these are the advantages in spite of all these advantages there are disadvantages for this modified tunnel technique it requires special tunneling instruments it is mandatory you require special instruments it is time consuming it is technique sensitive naturally the post operative the difficulties are more there will be more swelling uh, than uh, for uh, than uh, you have with the uh, standard coronal advanced flap and the coronal advancement that you get is limited up to 3 mm that is why all these techniques are employed for uh, multiple gingival resections less than 3 mm so uh, uh, that is a complication that is a problem and uh, it is not useful for resections more than 3 mm these are the drawbacks of modified tunnel technique now before i final i conclude i will uh, familiarize you with one suture technique which has got a biggest advantage when you do a tunnel flap or modified coronally advanced flap it is an anchored suture or a suspended suture horizontal vertical mattress suspended suture with an anchor point anchor point is the stable point where you anchor the suture thread to hold the flap in its new position it is called a double cross suture and usually we use they use uh, the interdental contact as the anchor point if the interdental contact is not good enough you have to place some composite in the interdental area and you have to use that as the anchor point two advantages for this suture is because when you when you do a tunnel flap or a coronally advanced modified uh, flap with a modified technique the two things you have to achieve is coronal repositioning you need to have a traction for coronal repositioning at the same time you have to compress the flap to minimize the clot beneath the flap so two things you need to achieve this particular suture technique the double cross suture will achieve both these it will provide traction for coronal repositioning and it will achieve it will provide flap compression to reduce the clot clot thickness to enhance healing but to do this gingival biotype is a limiting factor because uh, you have to pass the needle through the papilla two times in order to make it vertical mattress so if the gingiva is very thin and friable especially if the surgical papilla you created is in coronally advanced flap is thin uh, this may uh, have some limitation for this particular suture to employ and this is the double cross suture you start from the buccal flap and you cross the anchor point like this and you go back to the palatal flap you engage the palatal flap you come back and again you engage the anchor point so two times the anchor point is crossed that is why it is known as double cross suture and you can engage the flap on the buccal aspect like this it's a vertical mattress suture so if the papilla is very thin it is difficult to do this and this will how it look like you can you can give a, a coronal traction at the same time you can give compression also so that is the advantage of this uh, modified uh, double cross suture technique so it is indicated in uh, uh, tunnel flaps which we do in uh, periodontal phenotype modification therapy root coverage and in second stage implant surgery you can make use of this particular suture technique advantages are coronal uh, traction for coronal positioning and stabilization and compression in the graft bed region disadvantages thin papilla you cannot employ this frequently and uh, i would like to mention uh, when we uh, attended, we had a fortunate uh, uh, for we were fortunate enough uh, myself and dr baiju we attended the recent euro perio conference in copenhagen and the first session we uh, visualized or we witnessed was by otto zur and majority of the content i have adapted from his article and what they did was Uh, they did uh, it was a live surgery session comparing the step by step comparison between a modified coronally advanced flap by uh, suchelli and disanctis and the tunnel, modified tunnel technique by otto zur and uh, suchelli they one is done one surgery is done in italy the other surgery is done in spain and uh, otto zur uh, actually he uh, moderated the surgical steps uh, very effectively and uh, fortunately we had lot of inputs and i have Uh, tried my be level best to incorporate what i got from that presentation in this presentation of my presentation and i hope you will be benefited by this so that finishes uh, my session i have talked whatever i gained by reading from my teachers from my experience on soft tissues i still feel soft tissues are very important i have mentioned the techniques available the selection of a technique evidence 
present evidence and how to evaluate the outcome. And I have, uh, uh, I hope I have completely covered the tips and tricks in soft tissue handling to the best of my knowledge in recipient set preparation, donor site assessment, and handling the graft and the flap. And I have just brushed through what are the different flap designs that has been evolved depending upon the merits and demerits of each over a period of time and what is the present status of these flap design in periodontal plastic surgery around natural tooth and around implants. I take this opportunity to thank uh, the principal of Government Dental College Koyiko, Dr. Saumitran sir, faculty, residents, Department of Periodontics, Government Dental College Koyiko. And uh, once again, I thank uh, uh, NITE and uh, uh, the study group, Dental Education Unit, and uh, Department of Periodontics, Abishati Memorial Dental College, uh, Mangalore, for uh, providing me this uh, big opportunity, I should say, big opportunity uh, to interact with you on a topic which I like the most. I want to spread this message. I hope I have uh, achieved my uh, target. If anybody listening to this session, if you have able, if you are able, if you were able to at least uh, take one or two points from this session, I feel I have achieved my objective. Special thanks to once again to our evergreen uh, personality of periodontology, Biju Thomas sir. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Hari. Shall I unshare, sir? Yeah, you can. Yeah. No, that is a very comprehensive presentation okay. on everything on flap design, incision, thickness, the how to maintain the wound stability, and the currently where we stand. In, in these matters. Now I've gone through the chat box. There are no questions. Probably it is such a comprehensive presentation that everybody <laughs> has been. One thing I was noticing that everybody who has logged in is still there on the line. That shows that people are quite impressed with your Thank you, sir. talk. Now, before, one minute, a uh, uh, head of the department will like yes, to address. Sir. Yes, sir. A oh, very beautiful lecture by Dr. Hari. I congratulate you on delivering such an informative lecture. I'm sure PGs have benefited a lot from your lecture. The different incisions and different sutures which you have told was very, very interesting and uh, very well followed. Thank you, ma'am. Well you. followed. Thank you. So, and uh, the feedback link is there for the uh, viewers. Please uh, share it, I, uh, fill it and share it fast within 24 hours. Otherwise, tomorrow it will get disabled. And after the feedback link is shared, the certificate will be sent to your mail ID. Okay, I congratulate again, Dr. Hari. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. The Thank good you. lecture. Hari, Thank before, you, sir. before we wind up, I request Dr. Smitha Shetty, uh, Reader Please. Department of Periodontics to give the vote of thanks. Good morning, everyone. I deem it my pleasure to propose the vote of thanks for today's program. First and foremost, uh, I would like to thank our today's speaker, Professor Dr. Hari Kumar K. Sir, thank you very much thank for you. your informative and uh, educative lecture. Thank you, ma'am. Next, uh, I would like to thank our uh, dynamic dean, Professor Dr. U.S. Krishnaik, for his constant support and uh, guidance. We are always grateful to you, sir. I would like to also thank a charming uh, vice principal, Professor Dr. Mitra and Hegde for her support and kind words. Thank you, ma'am. I would uh, like to thank Nitte Deem to Be University and especially Mrs. Sadhna Deshmukh, director of our university staff development center for providing this online platform and all the support for conducting this CD program successfully. I would also like to thank the ISP Dakshina Kannada branch for organizing this wonderful lecture and last but not the least, the faculty and the postgraduate students from various institutions, and as well as from our own college for participating in today's CD program. Thank you, one and all. Have a great day. Hari, one more yeah. uh, yes, sir. Uh, thing to say that uh, 
in case some anybody has missed out on today or they could not attend part of it or you would like to go through i am sure many of us would like to go through it again in, even i have noted many points which i would like to go through the lecture so this will be available on our university website if you permit us we can share it to the speak and uh, other platforms so Definitely, that Definitely sir it is not my property it is your property sir. no sir, no <laughs> are you being the speaker i have to take your permission before sharing it so we'll definitely we'll definitely. be share, sharing the lecture so that in case people who have not been able to attend can again go through it huh? if you can't share the knowledge what is the use sir yes definitely i am yes. i am of that opinion knowledge is I know, always I know. meant to be shared yes then But only it will grow <laughs> but the uh, proprietary demands that i should take your permission before sharing it that's why i have asked you for granted okay. humbly oh, thank you hari so much thank you once again i'm sure a lot of people have benefited from today's program hari thank thanks, you so thanks, much sir. thank, thank you, you for so the opportunity much. yeah thank you so we'll wind up as of today thank yes, you sir. so much bye bye sir bye thanks to all the delegates who have logged in also i'm sure lot, all of you have attended for the full 2 hours you are here and every word we have picked up and i'm sure especially our budding postgraduate students have been immensely benefited by this program thank you hari thank you sir thank you ma'am